<sighs> like in true Letter Kenny fashion, season 6's finale dropped a huge bomb on us at the end that left us hanging. If you don't remember, Wayne planned on proposing to marry Fred. However, before he can ask the question, she tells him to wait until they've made it inside. This is where we see Wayne pulling out a small box that has an engagement ring in it. Now that we got the quick intro out of the way, let's just jump into Season 7, Episode 1. Katie, Dan, and Daryl are sitting at the kitchen table having dinner, talking about how Glenn came to the produce stand to see if they had azaleas. As for why he was looking for them, it was so he could use them to make the TV studio that he was managing look nice. A couple seconds later, Wayne finally makes an appearance where he's clearly not happy about being late for steak night. But what exactly made Wayne late? His simple answer was that there was too much choring to do, but Katie states that it was no more than any other year. Now, as for the more in-depth reason... It's because every farmer with an acreage or an operation inside two townships is calling me for advice on this or help with that, fuck. Like who? McMurray calls me not once, not twice, but thrice a day. McMurray's a piece of shit. Oh, when a friend asks for help, you help him. Why don't you tell him you're busy? When a friend asks for help, you help him. This gives Dan a good idea. He says that Wayne should start his own agricultural show where he spends an hour a week taking phone calls and answering questions. Lucky for them, they now have Glenn and his studio to help them out with this idea. After hearing that they'd help with the show, Wayne is fully on board with giving the show a go. I wonder what they're gonna call it. In the next scene, we see the Hicks are all seated in the studio with Mr. McMurray standing in front of them. I heard you just start your own agricultural consultant show because apparently I call you too much. Did you say that? Add some smirk emojis. Annoyed with the accusation, McMurray says that he's going to start his own rivaling show. Unbothered, Wayne tells Mr. McMurray that if he's going to do it, it will need to wait until after his show since their time slot is tight enough as is. Glenn tries to get Wayne ready for hair and makeup where he declines the services. As for his wardrobe, he states that there's no need for that either since he's already dressed the way that he wants to be. <laughs> then enter Roald and Stewart who recommends calling the show Hickelodeon, a clear play on Nickelodeon. They, uh, kindly pass on that recommendation and then the countdown for Wayne's show begins. As for the name of the show, they decide to go with Crack and Ack conveniently the title of this episode. It's now one minute until the show is officially on air, and everything seems to be firing on all cylinders. We've got Katie streamlining all the incoming calls while Stuart and Roald are blurting out theme song ideas. We have Glenn running around to ensure everyone is prepared on set, and lastly, McMurray. Stripped down to his underwear looking for his clothes that Glenn took. Glenn, you're very good at this job. Oh, well thank you. I actually have a degree in management. What kind? Micro! Time! Uh... 10 seconds. Right on set! Ring the bell! The show now is about to begin and it goes off with a rough start. But after their awkward introduction, they take their first caller. We have Brett Nickel on the line. Is it really? Yeah. Well, can he hear us? <laughs> I can hear you. Very on. Bretsky! You don't need to yell, he can hear you just fine. How are you now? Oh, good news? Not too bad. Very on. Uh, Bretsky, the show's called Crack and Egg, and well, I bet you can't, so. Thanks. You bet. Even the calls are off to a rocky start. Their biggest issue is keeping the show on track and the conversations on topic. Tip of the dong, the teeth tense. Tip of the dong, the teeth tense. Tip of the dong, the howl, 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 howl. <laughs> Patch him in, preacher! We then move on to Mr. McMurray and his show, The Agricult, to see how it's going. Long story short, every single call he receives is pertaining to his wife and how they want to be with her. I'd like to remind the callers at home that this is an agricultural show. Please keep the questions ag-related. Thank you. Right now, if you can help me cross the finish line, how does your wife orgasm? Is it like a high-pitched squeal or is it more like a, a low groan? Thanks, buddy. Fuck. Oh, no. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck! Hang up, preacher! Okay. Fuck that shit. Fucking, I'm kind of looking forward to the next one. That was a good time today. Before we move on with this scene, I really want to say how these writers love making you wait to see the outcome of previous season finales. 17 minutes into the episode and with only 4 minutes left, and we only just now get a development on how the proposal went. Turns out Wayne and Mary Fred are officially engaged. And this scene right here is pretty much just Wayne's engagement party. 
Riley and Josie take it upon themselves to ask that since he's now engaged, if they're able to hook up with girls that he's dated in the past. I would pull out with tennis so fast. Couldn't wheel tennis, you pylon. Buddy, you couldn't wheel a fucking tire down a hill. You haven't seen his dick. Sir. Neither have you. You'll just have to take that up with tennis. So, what about the... Angie who? Sick, buddy. I'd love to smash her. Sick, boys. See if she wants to smash right after this. Yeah. <laughs> but there's one person that has been missing yet that we finally get a life update for. And that person is... Rosie. Rosie O'Donnell was on Howard Stern the other day, and she's a damn good interview. Well, everybody's good on Stern. Couldn't help but catch a bit of the combo. Just because you're married doesn't mean you can't smash a whole bunch of people. I can confirm. Hell of an engagement party. Merci. It's more like a stump burn to me. Katie and Mary Fred finally join the group where Katie calls for a toast in celebration of the engagement. And by the way, I like the little detail where Stuart and Rhoda are the only ones without a drink in their hand since they're still sober. I almost forgot about that. This season premiere started on the slower side, especially compared to season 6. But it was a pretty relaxing way to start season 7. Though it was a little bit of a letdown that we didn't see how Wayne proposed. Especially now that we know that he couldn't do it outside in private, but instead actually had to do it inside Modine's. This is what I meant when I mentioned in revisiting Letterkenny season 1 and 2 that the show doesn't wait for you. The story continues even if we're not there to witness what happens. Yeah, well, welcome to uh, another crack and egg and that you can't, so. Now on episode two. The episode opens with the Hicks in the studio doing another crack and egg show. In the code open, they speak to a guy named Keith Graydanis, also called Gray Daniels, about a guy named Dalton Thibodeau. Long story short, it's just Keith venting about how Thibodeau is far less productive than the other people that he works with. The Hicks tell him that all he needs to do is give him a good kick in the ass, where Gray says that nowadays they can't do that due to people complaining about things like anxiety, depression, etc. Once the call with Gray Daniels ends, Dalton Thibodeau calls in and almost immediately a screaming match ensues. Been another episode of Crack and Egg. If you like, just want to call in with agriculture related questions next week, see if you can crack an egg. Well, I bet you can't. So, uh, so we'll talk to you. After the show ends, Katie says how there were at least 13 more people in the queue waiting for them to take their call, where Dan then recommends weeding out all the people who don't want to talk about agricultural issues. Wayne takes this a step further and says why stop at the show? Why not do this in real life? He refers to soccer's red card and yellow card system except in a social setting. If you're being dumb, you get a yellow card. If you continue being dumb, you're then given a red card, meaning that you no longer have to deal with that person. The Hicks visit Riley and Josie at the gym to test out this new system by listening to their business pitch called Leg Day Bay. What's that? You like soccer? She called football. Fuck off. New program in effect, boys. If you're being a dink, you get a yellow card. Which is essentially a warning. And then if you keep being a dink, you get a red card, which means we're no longer obligated to give you the time of D. We haven't even showed you the full pitch yet. Let us make up some ground, boys. Pitter patter. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, okay. So, those looking to learn the Leg Day Bay way must fill out this Leg Day Bay survey. We put all the names on a Leg Day Bay tray and select them randomly, and boom, match you with your future Leg Day Bay. With Leg Day Bay Pay, you skip the Leg Day Bay tray, and you select your own Leg Day Bay from this Leg Day Bay display. That's it. Oh, are you serious? Are you oh blind? How can you not what? see it? What? This is what? Work. Come on! Are you well, on our work here is done, boys. Wait, there's more. Now it's Ron and Dex's turn with their pitch of Gay Leg Day Bay. <laughs> oh boy. Gay Leg Day Bay. Quick, light up the Gay Leg Day Bay display. This is Leg Day Bay. And Leg Day Bay pay for, for gays. gays. Let's smash some ass. Let's get so fucking gay. Or skip the Gay Leg Day Bay beret with Gay Leg Day Bay pay, which allows users to select their own Gay Leg Day Bay. Likely take them down, too. We're anticipating significant gay takedowns for subscribers of Gay Leg Day Bay Pay. Let's get super fucking gay. Let's get some ass. No! Oh, you gotta see that! That's bullshit! Come on. Did you see that display? Oh, come on! Look at that display! Come on! Come on. The Hicks then visit the skids who are working on a new song for Crack and Ag. We also learn their band name. The hottest sex imaginable. What? The hottest sex imaginable. 
Where? That's the name of our band. The hottest sex imaginable. The hottest sex imaginable. With our debut album, Fuck This and Fuck You. Yellow card? Decent band. Terrible name. Are you adapting football rules to reality? If you serve me a red card, you may not ask me to vacate. We'll let ourselves out. Think about it. Over at Glenn's, the hits catch up on this project where he's working on t-shirts with all Brent Letterkenny slogans. Wine. All right, out. Thank you for asking. Well, that's about. <laughs> that. Pitter patter, let's get going. Yeah. Air ball. Like this. Get ready for it. Apparently. Oh, swings and a mess. You're welcome. This. Take your time, read the whole thing, it's long. When you love your job, it never seems like work. Oof. Strike three. <laughs> For the guys. Cause that's what they always say! Rim and out. Oh, this is too easy. Boy, howdy. Then there's McMurray who gets yellow and red carded almost instantly as he tries to pitch his idea of selling Arabic fabrics. Only humidity. Yellow card. Oh, thank you, Wayne. Brings on the hint of lemon in my eyes. I stumble across a truckload of this beautiful Arab fabric. So we brought it all up here and we're gonna sell it by the foot. Calling it! A rabbit. We don't have any red. That's mauve, fuchsia, and that's his of magenta. Next. Last on their list is Gail. Where's that Marie Fred? And when are you gonna take me down? And why isn't that happening to sweet? It's behind that curtain. What this thing? Mo Dean's family style pub and grill. Tap house, eatery, resort, and golf casino. Oh, it's on side! Fuck rat! <laughs> Fuck you! Fuck this! The final scene of this episode is with Great Daniels again with the update on Dalton Thibodeau. She says that after a good kick in the ass, Thibodeau picked up the slack around work. And as it turns out, Gray Daniels is actually sitting next to Thibodeau in the break room as they speak. He then hands over the phone to him after letting the Hicks know that he wants to speak with them. So hey, Gray Daniels had the balls to say sorry for telling tales out of school, so do you too? Fuck you, Thibodeau! So, this wasn't my favorite episode. Maybe I'm just not a fan of the whole show within a show format that's going on right now. But, let's move on to my favorite episode of this season. Episode 3. Nut. <laughs> this is a good one. Oh, come on, white boy, goddamn. You better not nut before I nut. Oh, goddamn. Oh, hold on that nut, boy. Oh, yeah, stretch me out, big boy. I'm a nut. Shit. Oh, shit. Oh, that's it, white boy. You give me the goodest nut. And now you go give me that butt nut. Oh, come on, white boy, goddamn. Yeah, you heard that right. Dan was having some, uh, alone time. Ain't nothing to be ashamed of. Even the best of us get a little adventurous sometimes. So after Dan's little browsing session, we jump to the following day with him staring blankly as he drinks his beer with the rest of the Hicks. And out of everyone, Gail, of course, is the first to notice Dan's unease and calls him out on it. The conversation attracts the company of Stuart and Rold as Gail proceeds to ask Dan what he saw. He tells her that he's not sure if he's comfortable saying what's got him so shaken in public. Gil probes further by asking where he saw it, which leads him to confirming that he saw it on a website. This was all the information that they needed to guess. Stuart is the first to guess that it was porn, and now Dan's confirmation has opened the floodgates. What are we talking here? Cream pie? Hentai? Guy on guy? I'm uncomfortable. Come on, Dan. We're all friends here. That's a stretch. <laughs> Don't say stretch. The group encourages Dan to share more where he's still hesitant. He tries to explain but gets choked up almost instantly. To keep himself from speaking, he begins to chug his beer. Hey boys. Hey. Mia. Mia. Sophia. Sophia. Mia Sophia. Over at the gym, we see Riley and Jonesy being approached by three girls who ask if they're hockey players. They respond honestly and say that they aren't currently. 
Josie asks why they're asking, where Mia Sophia says that girls love hockey players and walks away with two other girls. Bonnie McMurray then pays him a visit and mentions how her brother is playing junior hockey. Riley and Josie tries to give her words of encouragement, where she reassures them that she's not worried about him, since girls like hockey players. Afterwards, we see how much Riley, Jonesy, and even Tyson enjoy boy all miss hockey. I miss it, bro. Yeah. Back at Modine's. Oh my god, white boy got down. Oh, you give me the epicest nut. Oh, you beneath that pineapple, white boy got down. I'm a taste the tootiest, fruitiest nut. Yep. Dan is showing the Hicks and company the video he saw. Gail Stewart and Katie say that they've all seen it, while Derry goes a bit further and says that he's seen her in a bunch of other things. I've seen a bunch of things in her. Wayne? Wayne being the gentleman he is neither confirms nor denies if he's seen the video or her in anything else before. And leave it to Gail for saying what most of us were probably thinking. Did you nut, hmm? white boy? Damn. He nutted. Righteous. Yeah. I feels exposed. You know, I get a kick out of how she attaches food to the nut. Yeah, like that's what the dude giving her the nut just ate. Yeah, come on, give me some of that garlic soy baby bok choy nut. Oh, yeah, give me some of that chopped the peanut butter corn pie nut. Oh, yeah, give me some of that cinnamon dunkaroos nut. Oh, yeah, give me some of that spicy unagi nigiri nut with the epic deliciousness. Goddamn, boy. I ain't never had a nut, so help it. Yeah. Safe to say everyone gets a kick out of it, Dan. The group tries to make Dan feel better about his browsing by saying that there's no need to be embarrassed and that everyone watches porn. Right, Wayne? Not gonna bite. Well, that's kind of like a birthright there, good buddy. This leads to Dan asking the group what kind of porn they watch, where they all respond by sipping their drinks. Back when Riley and Josie, Bunny asked them what they miss most about hockey, where they admit that they mostly miss the girls. But a quick thought here, I never imagined how empty life actually would be for Riley and Jonesy when they don't have hockey. Like aside from the gym, what do they even do? Those two have a really big character development crisis this season. Oh man. But back on with the main group at Modine's, we see them all crowded around Dan's laptop once again. This time, they're watching each other's favorite porn videos. It's fucking weird, Derry. You're fucking weird, Derry. Well, how is that any more weird than, ooh, yeah, give me some of that Denny's Grand Slam with extra sausage links, nut! She keeps calling him daddy? No, she isn't. She's calling him daddy. No, she is. She's calling him daddy. And it's fucking weird, Derry, because you're fucking weird, Derry. Gil then shows the group her favorite porn, and, uh... In the words of Gail, Some of that good fucking. The group minus Gail seem to all be in agreement that that kind of acting in porn is too over the top to be seen as enjoyable. But now to my favorite conversation of the episode. Stuart's that big. Oh. I'm not... Stuart. Okay, let's get real here. It's not that big. Is it? It is. Whoa. Well, Stuart, there was that one time where he got an erection, it was so big and so long that uh, he actually passed out for several hours. Sup, Skid? And, and I heard gay climax like that several times. My gay sex is none of anyone's business. Your gay sex? Fine. Gay sex filled me up inside, okay? Does it? Yes. After gay sex, there is no other sex. Are you happy? The gay sex was different than all the other sex you'd had then? Gay sex is the best of all sex. I guess for the record, I should clarify that Stuart is referring to having sex with gay. But, uh, yeah. As we all could have expected, Stuart is still not over having to separate from gay. But after all the porn talk, Dan leaves to go to the bathroom, Wayne and Mary Fred go to watch a movie, and Katie and Derry leave to play a game of crib. This leaves only Stuart and Rold, who's still sulking over gay. <sighs> to up his mood, Rold offers him one thing that always has been there for him since season one. Rips? Absolutely. Yep. I'll see you in your big fucking dick later. Sup, Schmelt? Sup, Fizzy? We have a quick scene at the gym where we see Riley and Josie walking over to a Schmelt they knew. Before they could chirp at him, they realize that he was picked up by a senior AAA hockey team in the city. 
And before they can get too down, Bonnie offers to buy them a beer, which quickly cheers them up. Oh, Bonnie McMurray. Dan finally returns from the bathroom. He says that he feels better about the whole porn watching situation and that he now understands that what he watches is no one else's business but his own. To each his or her own, cowboy. You want to get that nut? What, boy? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Jumping on into episode four, we see Wayne and Katie in the middle of a very intense stare down. Welcome to this year's Sister vs. Brother fundraising challenge in supports of Don Cherry's Pets Rescues Foundations. Weren't you going to come up with a catchier name this year? And we were, but the only word that rhymes with sibling is nibbling. And that gets real weird real fast. So what's going on here? Apparently every year, Wayne and Katie compete to see who can raise more money for a charity called Don Cherry's Pet Rescue Foundation. According to Dan, Katie won last year. We also learned that Katie won the year before that as well. But wait, <laughs> there's more. Katie is undefeated in the five-year histories, or should we say, histories of this year's events. I love me a good sibling rivalry. Also, I think this is the first time we've seen Wayne and Katie go head to head rather than working together. But moving on to their challenge this year, it's called Letter Kenny vs. Penny. The objective is actually pretty simple. The one who fills out the most pan cans with pennies wins. And the person who loses has to roll all the pennies collected, since at the end of the day, this is all being collected for charity. Okay, Katie. Okay, okay. Good luck. I look forward to being the bark attack of your demise. And to you, big brother. Who's a good boy? <sighs> May the best sibling win. Next thing we see Katie getting an early star by stopping at Modine's to get Gail's help. She agrees to be of assistance and then they shake on it. Yeah, I caught that parent trap reference. We see Wayne, Derry, and Dan standing around the kitchen table brainstorming the best way to make money fast. A lot of ideas get thrown around, but Wayne has come up with a foolproof master plan. I got a plan, good buddy. Wanna know what the plan is, good buddy? Here's the plan is good buddy. I can tell you what the plan is, good buddy. Door to door, less is more. Go on. Urgency. I'm listening. Derry, give me your wallet real quick. See? See what? Take it back. Derek, give me your wallet. But you just gave it back to me. Derek, give me your wallet real quick. See? I believe I do. <laughs> That's actually a really good plan. It's simple, but people really do respond rather quickly when you give off a sense of urgency. Honey, for your thoughts, Jim? Jim Dickens? Shit, we haven't seen him since the spelling bee. Anyway, Katie asked Jim if he can spare a penny or two where he asks what for. She tells him, but it's actually Gail that gives Jim to hand over the money. Turns out Gail is actually a pretty good wing woman when it comes to getting money. Listen up, y'all. Buck 99 highballs till midnight. Bonnie, grab your friends, buy a round. That's one strategy, Katie Cat. Katie tells her that this is only a drop in the bucket. Gail proceeds to tell her that if she really wants to collect more money, she's going to have to start telling a couple of white lies. So the plan here is simple. Make up a new charity that best suits the person's interests. A little white lie never hurt anyone. Hey, get off your wallets, you saucy fuck! Yeah, you saucy fuck! 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 Hey, you want a drink? Hello. Ooh, this is a good scene. So Wayne, Dan, and Derry go to visit Mia Sophia to see if she has some pennies to spare. But uh, for some weird reason, they keep getting distracted. It's my chest, isn't it? Sorry? My chest? Just picked it up from a garage sale. Real conversation piece. Mm-hmm. Same with my jugs. What's that? My grandpa makes moonshine, which those are perfect for. Can you imagine my grandpa and his buddies sucking on these jugs? No. Uh, well, how do you feel about pet rescue? How do you feel about these puppies? Just rescued these tits a few weeks ago. Give them a little kiss. The tits? What else? I'd better not. Say, I'm collecting so that more 
tits get homes. All right, well, uh, before I head back to the dugout, can I grab your spare pennies real quick? Yeah, I've got a couple big cans, but you can have them. Okay. Here. You know you'd have these tits in your hands sooner than later. No, I didn't, but here they are. And Come one. Here. Hello. And a two. Hi. Hi. Before you go, let me get my girls out for you. Would have been rude of them not to say goodbye. Wow. Did you see the size of those things? What? I'm talking about the cans, people. Jeez. That must have given Wayne a good lead. Now, how's Katie doing? Thanks for supporting the YMC Hay. Word Vision puts books in the hands of people that need them most. Thank you. I'm collecting for Unicelf to send myself to university because I need it. We learn that the guys are being helpful, but the girls aren't biting. Superhero Gail swoops in and gives her the idea to find someone to get the girls' attention. And with that, Katie calls her back up. Whoa, 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 look at what that cat dragged in. That's better than what the cat coughed up. Next up on Wayne's money trail is the coach's house where we get a little bit of a depressing development with him. That being his continued grieving over his late wife, Barbara. The last time we heard him speak of his wife was when? During the talent show? This poor guy, man. <sighs> Anyways, the coach quickly grabs a jug of pennies he'd been saving for something called Noah's Bark, but decides to give it to Wayne instead. And at the end of the scene, we witness this. What's that, Barb? Oh, it's no one. I'll draw you a bath. This tug to my heartstrings kinda hard. This man has been teetering on the stages of grief since season four, episode two, when we first learned about the death of his wife at the golf course. This is when it dawned on me that the coach wasn't meant to be just a funny character. He's a broken character who hasn't been able to put himself back together since the death of his wife. All the anger and yelling makes so much sense now when looking at this scene. Props to the writers for this one, man. Oof. Moving on from that heavy scene, Riley and Josie make it to Modine's to meet Katie after receiving her call. I need you to go table to table, collecting all the pennies from all the ladies. What? Why? What is this, W fucking five? Do as you're told. Work those women. Oh, that sounds a bit shysty, boys. It's Mennonite shysty, bro. This just in, it's fucking pennies. And a little white lie never hurt anyone. We'll go talk to girls, boys. Pennies only. I'm looking at dimes. <laughs> yes, we can. Say, so let me grab your spare pennies real quick. I happen to have me a whack load of them little devils. Next up on Wayne's list is Mr. McMurray, and he also has a shit ton of pennies to give him. At this point, all signs are pointing towards Wayne winning this year's charity contest. Hi, we're hoping you can help. Yeah, we are collecting pennies for a charity that is very close to our hearts. Ronnie and Jonesy attempt to help Katie out with her penny collecting by seeing if they can get any from Mia Sophia. So far, she's on board with giving them money if they take off their shirts. Not more than what Wayne got from her, but hey, every penny counts. Good boy. Back with Wayne, we see he's still going strong on his penny collecting spree. Honestly, I think now he's so far ahead that Katie has no chance of catching up, even with Riley and Josie's help. It's a good effort, of course, but god damn. Wayne's approach just proved to be more effective, though Katie's was heaps more entertaining to, uh, watch. Next stop for Wayne, the skits. I hate to see that Stewart's going back to hard drugs again, but Pennywise, Stewart's got a lot of them. Or should I say Rold? Rold being the businessman he is offers his paintings in exchange for some chores he needs done around his house. Like what? My tub needs to be recocked. One of the cabinet doors in my kitchen is making this noise like <laughs> every time you open it. The mosquito netting around my canopy bed has a tear in it. The handles on my vanity are jiggly. 
in my bone china. To say the least, Wayne is not that desperate for pennies. Rolled. I hadn't finished yet. Yes, you did. I can smell it. Happy with her penny collection turnout with no time to spare to gather more, Katie makes her way back home where it's time to crown the winner. Let's see how this goes. Solid haul, big brother. Yep. Well, there's just nothing to scoff at either there, half full. Ever the optimist, but this is clearly your year. Mm-hmm. I'm really happy for you, big brother. After congratulating Wayne, Katie heads upstairs. This is when we see Wayne's dissatisfaction despite his victory. He then heads back to the skids to speak with Roll to see what he needed to have recocked. The next day, Katie comes downstairs and asks Dan and Derry how much Wayne collected. However, they aren't sure yet due to them still counting. But that's not all. Katie notices the additional paint cans filled with pennies that hadn't been there the night before on her stack. She then asks where they came from. Wayne then enters the kitchen and takes a seat at the table when Katie asks him if he knows where all the additional pennies came from. He acts surprised and says, No, no, I think we're done here. She wins. What? Are you counterfeiting? I'd counter with forfeiting, yes. Are you calling it, Wayne? Well, look at the size of her pile. It's way bigger. I mean, it just makes sense. Hoo-wee, <laughs> yo, wee, yo. Well, then, it's official. Katie wins. Big brother. I don't know what you did, but you definitely did something. Well, I don't know what you're talking about, but I do know that you won fair and square again. You're a good boy. And most importantly, more good boys and good girls get homes as a result. So if you'll excuse me, I should get rolling. More hands make less work. In for a penny. In for a pounds. Now that was a wholesome ending. However, this does make me wonder if that means for the past five years he let Katie win. Kick off episode 5 with some interesting news. I'm McMurray. Have a 5.15 inch penis. What? Oh, and also Tans' grandmother died and left over enough money to buy the Cary County Eagles. As for the reason she wants to buy the team, she says it's a good way to keep her cousins out of trouble and off the streets. Her goal is to create an entertaining enough environment for them to pay attention to. The current coach refuses to sell her the team. However, Tana says that she'll just go over his head and buy it and that money talks. So you can't go over my head? Why? Because W's talk, baby. So Tana puts on a wager. She puts together a team to play against the Eagles. If she wins, the coach will let her buy the team. If she loses... I'll suck your dick. Balls? Deal. Auntie talks, baby. We'll see about that, Auntie. With a whole new goal in mind, Hennis heads back to Letterkenny to start forming a team. The first person she visits is the coach who's picked up solo spinning. His newfound hobby is short-lived once Hennis says that she needs a coach so she can resurrect the Letterkenny Irish. But there is one issue. What? That team is dog shit. The coach and tennis head to the gym to recruit Riley and Jonesy who have been shown having a small identity crisis due to them no longer being hockey players. To say the least, they're happy about the new opportunity to play again. Ron and Dax also join the team and says that they'll help find guys as the coach and tennis round up the key players. Speaking of key players, time to visit the next two guys on their list. Tyson and Joint Boy. In a fitting setting, we find them both in the middle of a fight who are instantly recruited by Tannis just by showing off their physical ability alone. Next up on the recruitment list is Betty Ann and Mary Ann. It's good to see our ladies back, but even better to see that they're willing to play for the Letterkenny Iris that's being put together. Oh, did I say play? I meant coach. Hold up, how come they can't play? Just fucking around. Same. Absolutely in for telling men how to do shit. Absolutely in for telling men how to win shit. Phew. After a couple of remarks from the coach basically saying that they wouldn't be good enough to play alongside the guys, Marianne and Betty Ann take back what they said about coaching and end up challenging his team against the later Kenny Shamrockettes. If they lose, they'll agree to join the team as coaches and help the Irish go against the Eagles. Wow, that's the second bet this episode. 
Hello. Hello. Well, you, you go. go. No, no, you, you go. go. Okay, okay I'll, I'll go. go. I'm back. That's what you are. But I have to go back to Vancouver, right? Yeah, for Pitbull Rescue still? Yeah. You're a good fucking gal, Rosie. Now, this was unexpected. But she says this return is only temporary because she'll have to go back to Vancouver. The reason why she's here, however, is because she has the favor to ask. Oh! Come here, bud. Oh, who's a good boy? Who is this? That's Zeke. Leave Pitt. Pitt's our band in the province, I know. So that begs the question, how does she get him in? There isn't a vet in the province who backs breed specific legislation. They'll put anything on his papers you ask him to. So if anyone asks, he's a... Teacup Yorkie. Oh, is that what he is? <laughs> Kidding. American Bulldog. That's what he is. I need you to hold on to him for a couple days. Okay. Rosie really is the best. I still hate how she's that one that got away. Who knows what season eight will hold though, right? But anyway, Rosie asks Wayne to hold on to Zeke for a little while while she goes back to Vancouver to get his sister. And then Wayne asks a very good question I think we were all wondering. And then what? Then I'm back. Oh. Shit. The return of Rosie is upon us. Which now begs the question though of what will happen between them once she returns back to Letterkenny full time. Shit is getting good! Especially used to, just stay like that for me. Mm. Okay, you guys are gonna need to get mic'd before your sweaters go on. Mic? Tennis tells the team that they'll be mic'd up during games since her cousins love watching chirping compilations of mic'd up athletes on YouTube. When Tennis returns to the locker room, Riley and Jonesy tell her that a couple of players haven't made it yet, where she replies not to worry about them because she found someone better. Almost immediately, Riley and Jonesy know exactly who she's referring to. Will you two just man up and make out? I started an office pool for it, and the day I picked is tomorrow. Get tugging, tit fuckers. Fuck you, Shorzy. Hey, fuck you, Jonesy. Your mom wants to name the baby after the place it was conceived. Can't wait to meet Martha's Vineyard Shore. Fuck you, Shorzy. Fuck you, Riley. Your mom wants the same thing. How do I shorten down handicap bathroom at Cheesecake Factory in Boca Raton? <laughs> fuck! The hockey players make their entrance onto the hockey rink. And the Tennis puts on her headphones and begins listening to the chirping from Shorzy, and is already pleased with how well it's going. The Letterkenny Irish vs. the Shamrockets is underway, and within the first couple of seconds, Shorzy already scores the first point. Fuck you, Shorzy. First tuck of the campaign, boys, fucking get involved! Throughout the game, we see the Letterkenny Irish getting a flurry of points in addition to a constant chirping from Shorzy. What's your favorite kind of pizza, cuteness? Mine's pizza ass. Short chips. Mary Fred visits Wayne in the barn and she notices Zeke keeping him company. A gal I used to date brought him over asking for some help with him. Temporarily. She pushing up? No. Would I like her? Yeah. When a friend asks for help, you help him. Right? You guys get fully changed in between periods? During one of the periods of the hockey game, Marion and Betty Ann approach the coach and tells him that they concede. They then tell him that they'll help coach Litter Kenny Iris so they're prepared to go against the Eagles. Ice time's expensive, let's use it for practice. Set up the PK, get the PP going. Get jersey sorted for your line comments. What are you smiling about? Litter Kenny Iris, you're back. <laughs> Sharp coat, bud. Thanks, Wayne. Can I borrow it? You've got plenty to keep you warm in that turtleneck. Looks cozy. Hey, want to try it on? I've got to go to work. Hi, Daryl. Episode 6 is underway and everything seems to be going rather smoothly until Derry says he's going to be driving to Quebec. But why? To get Anik back. <gasps> Fuck off, Derry. <laughs> You're mine now. You here. 
Derry, if you drive to Quebec to beg a woman who cheated on you to come back, I will punch you in the stomach. She was just going back to Jean-Claude. <laughs> Fuck, Katie got him right in the processor. So, Derry, you think that she made that decision, came to tell you, and then went back to him? Derry, where do you think she was for those two weeks that you couldn't reach her? Taking racy Instagram photos. Yeah, yeah there's proof of that. Yeah. She was fucking him. Oh, well, that's a development. But Katie does have a good point. This would also explain the radio silence followed by the quick decision to go back to Jean-Claude the day after her return back to Letterkenny. We also almost witness a slip up from Glenn when he says that Anik is quite possibly the only person who could make him switch teams. Where Katie catches that and says, Glenn, switch teams to what? Catholicism? Wayne and Dan both agree with Katie and Wayne adds, If she cheats, or he, it's over. No exceptions. Wow, remember this quote. Derry asks Wayne if he'll go with him, where Wayne agrees to go, but doesn't support Derry's intentions on getting Anique back. This gives us a good look at a side of Derry that we haven't seen yet. Anger. Well, then you're not a good enough buddy. <gasps> good buddy. Scum to hell. Derry, if you make me fucking run right now. I wonder how Wayne would have reacted if he was all there and not drunk. This is the first time that one of Wayne's friends actually turned their back on the group. And for it to be Wayne of all people that you call out speaks volumes. Glenn tells the Hicks that it's time to start the show. Clearly irritated, Wayne says fuck the show and the others agree. Out of patience to further argue, he tells Glenn to start rolling the camera where Wayne proclaims, Welcome to the last ever crack and egg. Bet you can't. So after having four total practices in the span of six days, Tannis says that the Letterkenny Irish are ready to go against the Eagles. Riley and Jonesy appear to be in high spirits, but many of the team realize how difficult it's going to be beating the other team. They go on by saying how much they wish Bartz, Yorkie, Schulze, Fisky, and Boomtown were with them. Well, they're not here, and I told you I don't want to talk about those fuckers, all right? Yeah, but, but why? Bartz? Yorkie? Schulze? Fisky? Boom tap! Hey guys. Don't you have to be native to play for the native team? You have to be native to play for the native team. I'm eligible for Indian status because one or both of my grandparents has Indian status, you little bitch. Yorkie? I'm also eligible for Indian status because one or more of my parents has Indian status. Schultz. I'm also eligible for Indian status because an immediate family member, i.e. uncle, aunt, or cousin, is registered or entitled to be registered. Pussy. Fisk. My eligibility. All right, we get the point. <laughs> the senior five is back due to someone in their immediate family being of native heritage, which makes them all in one way or another eligible to play for the native team. You remember our little wager, Tannis? Mm, I think so. A bit like my favorite hockey player, EJ Crombie. Oh. A bit like my favorite mixed martial artist, EJ Penn. Right. Be like my favorite cast member from hit NBC sitcom The Office, DJ Novak. I think you're cute. I would have done it anyways. Really? But a bet's a bet. Let's go then. <laughs> God damn it, Tannis. She refocuses her attention back to Leonard Kenny Irish, where she admits that they have no chance against the Eagles, but to try and make the game entertaining, where they're all surprisingly on board. Derry visits Modine's before heading to Quebec to get Anique back. Much like the Higgs, Gail and Bonnie have the same reaction. Gail even tells him exactly what Wayne said. If someone cheats, then it's over for good. No exceptions. Once again, Derry doesn't listen. His main worry now is finding backup, so if a fight breaks out, he isn't too outnumbered. Gail tells him that everyone is out and about until we see Scotty Wallace, the ginger in boots, standing out of the way and looking over in their direction. Over at the Skizzit's basement, we see Allie and Bianca, the two girls we met at the club, there to ask Stuart for help. Apparently the dealer that they had ticked off when they sold on his turf is trying to kill them. Stuart asks the two girls why they think he would help them and here's their reasoning. Because you're a vigilante. And we heard you and your girl when we came to your door that day. Sounded like some of that good fucking. Mm-hmm. 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 Type of dudes that can pull that off are capable, competent men. Roll, Stuart. How does our schedule look? Damned. What can we do to convince you to move some things around. 
The hockey arena is slowly getting filled with people and even camera crews are getting set up to get coverage of the game. The Eagles coach puts on the extra set of headphones Tennis has and listens to the chirping of Swerzy, Riley, and Jonesy, and is even being entertained by what they're saying. Back at the studio, Wayne and Dan, completely hammered, are still taking calls as we see Rosie quietly making an entrance and taking a seat. With her, she has Zeke's sister, and now the two pups are officially reunited. It's a nice day. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's not too cold. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Finally in Quebec, Derry, accompanied by Scotty Wallace, the ginger in boots, sit in a truck outside the bar as they keep an eye out for Anique. We see she finally shows up surrounded by Jean-Claude's friends. Shit, get down! The hockey game is now starting and we actually see both teams trading points. Are you even fucking trying? You can try, eh? You can try! Sometimes you get speed bagged. Sometimes you get dummied. Happens in hockey. Part of the game. It's fucking embarrassing. The game is closed out by the Eagles winning with an end score of 11 to 5. That's it. What's it? That's the end of the queue. Forever. Oh. Crack and Hack is finally over and Rosie takes her leave with the two pubs after telling Wayne that she'll call him later. McMurray shows up to have eight beers with the Hicks, but is told he's too late. When he asks if Derry would have beers with him instead, they tell him that he's in Quebec trying to get a Neek back. McMurray is surprised that none of them went with him. Wayne reiterates his motto of not going back to someone who cheats on you and that they should never be forgiven. However, this does contradict another mantra that Wayne and friends say quite often, and that's if a friend asks for help, you help them. We're going to Quebec. That was some of that good fucking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is competent. That is capability. That, that is, is a man. man. I can't help you with your dealer. Stuart admits that in his current state, he can't help Bianca and Ali, but also says that he'll no longer rely on others to clean up his messes and that he'll do it himself. He then walks over to Rose's jerk off inspiration board and pulls off a picture of a bodybuilder. You're gonna do that guy? It appears we're gonna have another Stuart transformation to look forward to next season. Tennis and the Eagles coach meet up once again and he says that he no longer wants a BJ. Instead he wants to take Tennis out on a proper date. However, there is another order of business that he needs to talk to her about. Since the Eagles are on track to win in the league, he wants to recruit Riley, Jonesy, and Shorzy. But that's not all. He also wants Tennis to oversee the in-game show. To say the least, Tennis is excited. I don't uh, I don't put out till the second date. Come on, I want you to meet my cousins. Daryl. Anik. And here we are at the final scene of season seven. Oh man. Derry, Scotty Wallace, the Ginger and Boots all enter the bar where Derry approaches Anik and hopes to talk to her privately. Her brother Jean Guy tells him that some time has passed and that she and Jean Lance are happy and they should let them be happy. Derry attempts to ignore what Jean Guy tells him. This causes him to loudly repeat what he said to him in English, losing his patience. I said, let's let them be happy, my friend. What if I don't? Try it. Wayne. Toujours aussi cute avec ton turtle neck. Yeah. You want to try it on? Daryl justement partait. No, I wasn't. No, je pense que oui. What if you don't, mon frère? I, uh... La curiosité a tué de chat. Mon Jean McMurray. During this grab, one of the guys attempts to fend off Wayne, where he grabs him and throws him against the door. And what do we see? Yeah. 
just when we think things couldn't get any worse, things get worse. I knew something would have to come between Wayne and Mary Fred with the sudden return of Rosie, but I never would have expected her to be the kind of person to actually cheat on Wayne. Though this episode kept hitting hard on what Wayne and the rest of his friends thought about cheating, I had hoped this would have been strictly focused on Anique. Unfortunately, this isn't that kind of show. When something catches fire in Laird Kenny, everything tends to crash and burn along with it. And with this, we're left waiting to see how not only Wayne, but the rest of his crew will react to this revelation. The only good thing about all this happening is the timely return of Rosie to hopefully keep Wayne from spiraling. Wayne has had very tough luck with relationships, but this is one of the worst outcomes so far. He had found and proposed to someone he thought was as faithful as a person can get. Their bonding seemed genuine and there were no hints throughout the whole season of Mary Fred being unhappy or unfulfilled with what Wayne had to offer. From a viewer's perspective, there was no sign of anything wrong with their relationship and even so, this was the outcome given. This opens the next season to a ton of possibilities and I'm so excited to cover it all in Revisiting Letter Kenny Season 8. But until then, as always, thanks for watching and I will see you in the next one.